I am, to my own heart and soul, a children's librarian. I've worked for nearly 35 years serving kids and families as my North Star. I see firsthand how reading aloud with a young child can transform their learning, how stories can build kids' resilience and empathy and imagination, and how bonds and families are formed through story time, play, and book sharing. Library staff help wire growing brains for learning and life success for everyone. Libraries play a really critical role because they're the ones that can help elucidate for all of us that landscape. So let me take you back 15 years ago, because it began with a simple noticing that in fact, educators, as they talked about their classrooms, their library spaces, other learning sites, we heard them repeatedly saying, I'm just not connecting with kids the way that I used to. 15 years ago, we started making a bet on what today we call remake learning. And Remake Learning is today a network of more than 600 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, creative industries, campuses of higher education, all of whom are working to advance relevant, engaging, equitable learning. The challenge of and the need for digital literacy and access to the internet is not a new need. Uh, and libraries have historically played a strong role in the digital literacy and providing access to the internet for communities. So at the San Jose Public Library, we had always noted that even pre-pandemic, that we were the largest provider of public computing and free Wi-Fi in at least Northern California. Um, and this is certainly true post-pandemic as well. And um, our first priority was really with the schools, recognizing that, that anyone who didn't have access to the internet was cut off from their educational opportunity. Um, at libraries, we also felt that anyone who didn't have the internet suddenly didn't have access to library resources, um, which essentially, uh, you know, is uh, First Amendment protected free speech and uh, content and information that folks need to learn and during a time when they needed it more than ever. I helped to bring early learning spaces, story and play programs into everyday spaces like laundromats where we know families have upwards of a two hour wait time each week. And kids often have nothing more productive to do than to stare at the machines. This work also happens in WIC centers, family courts, we're even placing one in a funeral home and we have a pilot project in a county jail. We know through research, a young child's brain grows at an exceptional rate during the first years of life. Language and play are the vehicles through which a healthy child develops. We were really concerned about the fact that we were in a little bit of a book desert for a lot of our housing developments. It took anywhere from 15 to a half, 15 minutes to a half an hour to an hour on the bus for families to be able to get to the libraries. Um, we also discovered that many of the families didn't have books in the home that they owned. So we really wanted to make sure that our families had the accessibility to books and to the be able to encourage the child's love for reading. We know now that this summer and the coming summers are more important than ever. And again, the work that libraries do to help kids catch up and propel forward, uh, especially in response to COVID is more important than ever. We went from doing programming and, and things largely in person uh, to moving to a hybrid and virtual, a completely virtual kind of environment to deliver programming. So, um, you know, getting over that learning curve and learning hump um, uh, to do that successfully and, and well uh, with as much interactiveness and creativity as possible to, to maintain those connections through the electronic medium uh, was certainly a challenge for a lot of folks. Um, but I also saw um, folks being innovative um, in that space too. Well, in, in California, something close to half of the 6 million um, students in public schools qualify for the federal free or subsidized lunch program. And of those 3 million kids in the summertime, about 10% of them get meals as opposed to getting a meal every day in school. So if you take a step back from that, uh, you, if you're hungry, you can't learn. And so summer also poses uh, ch challenges. So here's what they often call summer slide um where you're 
sort of reading skills and everything else go on pause. And at the same time, you're hungry. That's a recipe for disaster. By families coming to the library, getting a meal from lunch at the library, plus some books, plus uh, an enrichment kit or some kind of, uh, you know, a mental puzzle or challenge or, or craft type project. It's just, it, it tags so many positive bases. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to understand why more money is being invested in. We definitely could not do the work that we do without the public library system. Not only are they partners at our events, they are hosting events that they make the libraries accessible to our families. They host special events at the libraries for our families. We are hosting story times on site for those families who are unable to get to the library sites. And they come around to our developments with a mobile bookmobile. So for families who are unable to come to the library, they make sure that they are coming to the families. It really makes our public housing families feel included in the community. And like they have a home at the library when they go. When we think about libraries and the roles librarians can play in the summer, I think of the relationship building aspect. That's so important. Knowing an actual librarian, a person who cares about you and knows your name and sees you day in, day out. Uh, to help you so much, uh, uh, so much mentoring, so much tutoring can take place inside a library. And we know how critical uh, those uh, experiences are. Here's a family and they come to the library and they come to the library because, because the kids are hungry. And this is a place, this is a place where the family knows based on their experience that it's a safe environment. It's a place where nobody's going to judge or question them. If, if California were to invest in a greater number of stronger readers, a lot of some of our most challenging issues wouldn't become as challenging because of what libraries do and because of what they can provide. There's a whole lot more benefit that's going on beyond simply addressing the issue of a, a kid who's hungry. I think that libraries have a unique and important role um, in mitigating digital equity issues and digital access issues. Now, nationally, but in San Jose, our library system was uniquely positioned to execute this work plan because one month prior to the first stay at home orders in our city were announced, we actually received approval from our city council for the city's first education policy, which was led by the library department. And it memorialized the library as the city's lead department on all education issues. So the library's ability to centralize, to process large amounts of data and materials and um, distribute to established locations throughout the city was an important element of this effort. And you think about that, libraries um, all over the country have those capacities just built into our DNA. We've also had many mothers who are very hesitant about reading to their children because English is not the first language or they never finish high school and they just are not confident with their reading ability. And when they attend the story times at our properties where it's the librarian and just a few families, five to 10 families, and they see how the librarians do the story time and they encourage them to, to read the books without necessarily reading the books, using the pictures and how to talk with their children about the books and how it's okay if they don't read word for word or if they mess up the words, to see the confidence that is built in the mothers and the ability to interact with their children and to be their child's first teacher is just breathtaking to watch. We've seen tremendous growth in this work across the country. What started as a kind of fresh and funny idea has grown into almost 300 sites across the nation. Elected and civic leaders are now taking this work on and we're seeing citywide networks coming from mayors, school districts, and public libraries of read, play, and learn sites growing and stemming from that mayoral initiative. Summer Learning in partnership with the National Summer Learning Association is now an annualized part of our programmatic offerings. Over 100 libraries are providing early literacy program and laundromats with more being added each week. Internet access is a commodity and um, the more you pay for that commodity, the better service you get. 
And that, you know, it's, it's completely antithetical to the belief of public libraries, to the, the entire, you know, purpose that we are working towards as even as, as a library, but also as a community. When you, you know, so you have this tension between wanting to, you know, democratize access and the fact that it is a, um, a business economy, essentially, currently. So that's a challenge we continue to, to debate and discuss. And, you know, the library will continue to provide free access whenever we can. There's been a steady increase both in the number of library locations that participate and the number of meals served. And I, I think part of that is just uh, people becoming aware that you can go to the library and get a meal. I, I mean, I've, I've testified in front of legislative hearings where a legislator will say, well, why? Why are libraries being forced to do this? And it's like, they're not being forced to do this. They're stepping into the, they're stepping into the breach and they're doing it because they know that this is what's helping their community uh, and the families that live in it. And it's, it's startling to me. Some of the statistics are that for, for the percentage of hungry Californians who are getting meals at libraries in the summer, for 13% of them, which, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it really is, for 13% of them, that's the only meal they're getting during the day. It's a really vexing and challenging problem, but it's so fundamental. And I, I, think, I think we can all do a better job of providing the meals and, and ensure that less Californians go hungry if we're all talking to each other and working together. And more of that is occurring um, the longer this program has been in place. Every young person, when they walk into that programmatic space, that they're greeted by a staff person that has the knowledge as well as the skill uh, and that competency to serve those young people at a high level. Um, and especially if that's happening in K-1-2, that's really setting them up for, uh, for success down the road. We can't expect a mom to sit down and teach her child the colors or the ABCs when they're worried about how they're going to pay the bills this month. Is the electric still going to be on? Will they lose their housing? Can they provide food? So we are working with the families when we're in home to help find them resources, to make sure the electricity stays on, to help find them food, to meet those basic needs. So then they feel comfortable and less stressed that they can take the time to help their child's learning. So public libraries exist in order to provide access to information knowledge that folks would need to participate effectively in a democratic society. Again, that access needs to be provided for free. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be exacerbating social differences in community, and you're going to be holding back communities, especially children of color, who really need access and to educational outcomes so that they can compete. I think in many respects, they're now community hubs. There's, there's a, a terrific book uh, called Palaces of the People that talks about how a, a vibrant library in a community builds that community's resilience. Libraries actually represent the best of, of human beings. So we create these places that are filled with information and tools for you to succeed and thrive. You, you being anybody. And I think that in part, that's what's contributed to the growth in lunch at the library is that libraries look outward, right? And see this need in their community that's being unmet and recognize that uh, what they can do is different, right? In, in that it can be more comprehensive than what a lot of other meal sites offer. They're the anchor in so many ways, and they're the ones that can connect so brilliantly to early learning centers, to after school programs, to schools themselves. And I suspect that libraries will be at the forefront as we think about credentialing learning, as we think about supporting this learning landscape, as we think about connecting smartly with parents, families, and caregivers in ways that support learning. I can't imagine this work happening without libraries again at the forefront as they have been time and time again.